Dr. Wolfe, still in May of 1983, um, I want to turn next to the Reference Centre Director's special meeting yes. on the 13th of May, which you attended. Yes. Show me, it's HCDO 603 underscore 008, please. Um, so we can see there a uh, special meeting of Haemophilia Reference Centre Directors, St Thomas's Hospital, 13th of May, 83. Dr Bloom there is Dr Krask, various other Reference Centre Directors. And then we can see you attending as a DHSS observer. Um, had you invited yourself to that meeting or been invited to it? Can you recall? I think I had invited myself. Uh, I know I invited myself to a subsequent meeting. I, I'm pretty sure I must have done because it was a reference centre meeting. So I think I did. Um, and then we can see if we just look at the text. Um, I, I know you've read it, so I won't go through all of it. But there's reference to publicity, anxiety, a need for haemophilia centre directors to discuss what should be done. There's reference to one haemophiliac suspected of suffering from AIDS, which is presumably a reference to, to Professor Bloom's own case. And then... If we go over the page, um, we can see uh, towards the end of that first paragraph reference to the reporting system. Um, and then uh, it says the steps to be taken should a patient develop the features of the full bone condition were then discussed. Insufficient, so it was agreed there was insufficient information available from the US experience to warrant changing the type of concentrate used in any particular patient. Um, and then, in terms of general policy, in the following paragraph, it notes that many directors have, up until now, reserved the supply of NHS concentrates for children and mildly affected haemophiliacs. It was considered circumspect to continue with that policy. It was agreed that there was as yet insufficient evidence to warrant restriction of the use of imported concentrates in other patients in view of the immense benefits of therapy. And that's then said to be a situation that would be kept under constant review. Um, do you have any recollection of that meeting? Yes, I can remember being at it, yes. Uh, and and can, do you have any recollection about the discussions beyond that which we see summarised in the minutes? No, I mean, I think it went on for much longer than the, the minutes appear to imply. Uh, these are really, I think, fairly condensed notes of the meeting. Yeah, I mean, it, certainly it's, it's described as a meeting that, that, that was held at 11am and it says the meeting closed at 2.15pm so it wasn't quite long um, uh, uh, d do you recall whether there was any discussion of any other possible changes of general policy or changes to treatment approaches mm. other than what we see here no I don't remember the discussion really at all I obviously took note of the conclusions uh, because I then went straight back to the department and, as it were, quoted them back to Dr Field. So I, I was obviously taking notes myself at the time, but I took notes of the conclusions and, and then came back and reported the meeting to Dr Field. I, I, I don't know whether you can answer this, Dr Wolford, but um, is your best recollection that there wasn't a discussion of other strategies or are you simply unable to to say one way or another i i am simply unable to say one uh, one way or another I, I simply don't recall the totality of the discussion i mean clearly i've been reminded and reminded several times of what the conclusions were but but more than that i i don't remember um, do, do you there's no reference in here to um what we n know was by now the proposal from Dr Galbraith. Uh, there's no reference in terms, at least. That's right. Um, um, there's a suggestion that it, it was, there was insufficient evidence to warrant restriction of the use of imported concentrates, but n n no more than that. Uh, and, and certainly the inquiries had some evidence to suggest that, that Dr, the content of Dr Galbraith's letter wasn't widely known uh, amongst clinicians. Did it occur to you to share the content of Dr Galbraith's proposal with the reference centre directors? Well, I don't think it can have done if it doesn't appear. And uh, essentially, it is a bit surprising, you might think. The question is whether or not they knew about that proposal. That, pro that 
suggestion came in on the 9th of May, and this meeting was on the 13th. I simply don't know, actually, but I think it would have been a good idea if they'd had that paper, but I, there's no reference to that, and I don't know that they ever did have. Um, and then, in terms of uh, the, the Cardiff case, Again, there's really very a passing reference yes, to it absolutely. almost in the minutes. Yes. Do you recall whether there was any more detailed discussion about it? Because you, you were here face to face with Professor Bloom. Mm. It was a, potentially an obvious opportunity to, mm. to ask more about it. Well, I think the, ob the thing is that these notes are so truncated. I can't, I, I obviously am not recorded as having intervened. So I either was sitting there saying nothing or they simply haven't recorded what I said. Nor is there really any, um, as it were, verbatim record, doctor this said this and doctor that, because you did find that in the other meetings. So these notes were, were really notes. I don't think they it could be described as a minute of the meeting. Um, so if we then turn to Dr Galbraith's letter and then um, your response, uh, setting out your views about it, uh, the, the letter from Dr Galbraith is CBLA 5043 underscore 040. Um, we've got the letter there, 9th of May, addressed to Dr Field. Um, and then uh, it, we can see headed action on AIDS, which is then the heading we see, I think, in, in some later minutes. Just maybe worth no noting... Um, he records the Lancet of the 30th of April, this is in the first paragraph, set, referring to the, the three cases in haemophiliacs in Spain. So it may be that that was a mechanism as to how that, that information um, got, got to, 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 to the department or into the public domain. Um, it, it, but in any event, we then go over... Um, uh, so actually, sorry, can I pick it up? The last paragraph of that letter... He says, I, I'm most surprised that USA manufacturers of the implicated blood products have not informed their customers of this new hazard. I assume no official warning has been received in the United Kingdom. And then over the page, we, we have his paper and his reasons for withdrawal of USA blood products. Now, um, I'm, I'll, come, I'll come to your observations about it in your memo and in, in, in your statement. But, but essentially what you say this doesn't reflect is the consequences to haemophiliacs yes. of not having the treatment. Yes. Before we get to that side of the coin, as it were, mm -hmm. is there anything particular in, in what Dr Galbraith sets out here that you disagreed with at the time? Apart from, obviously, the, the, uh, the corollary, which is basically so withdraw the products. In terms of whether the evidence seemed to be strong enough, uh, clearly there was epidemiological evidence, uh, and it was a strong epidemiological association uh, that he was talking about. Uh, it, in, we were in the situation in which uh, we really didn't know how much of a, an issue this was going to be in the UK. I mean, he's talked about implicated products in the USA. Was he talking about specific products or was he talking about the gen generality of, of factor eight? We really had insufficient, really had insufficient evidence um, that uh, what was being uh, suggested here was, was the right course of action at this time. And of course, against the, the fact that, that actually uh, you're going to cause real damage potentially to patients with haemophilia who couldn't get that, who wouldn't be able to get their factor eight. The factor eight would be cut by about a half in effect. And so there'd be massive rationing because the implication, he was actually saying, withdraw now on a temporary basis. But on a temporary basis, you would have 50% less factor eight in the country to treat um, haemophiliacs. So it was a very, very uh, draconian proposal on the basis of one case, and I totally accept that the case in Cardiff was a, was a case, 
um, and CDSC had, had uh, defined it as a case, but we had one case in this country and about 10 or 11 cases in the United States. So was the evidence sufficient? Certainly epidemiologically, the evidence was strong, epidemiologically, uh, but we had no other um, uh, evidence uh, to, to support that, we had no transmissible agent, for example, that we could actually identify at that time. So I was, of course, far from being alone in this thought because uh, Dr. Krask, whose letter to Prof Dr. Whitehead, um, who was the director then of the PHLS, said that he personally didn't think the evidence was strong enough at the moment, and he thought that there was going to be a need to wait and see what, it, what might eventuate, but we had to prepare ourselves potentially for, for taking um, more draconian action. So he didn't think the evidence was there yet, and quite clearly, of course, when ultimately it came to be looked at by the Committee on Safety of Medicine Biological Subcommittee, they didn't think it was sufficient either, or at least they thought they concluded that the risk to haemophiliacs at the time was low. And I'm sure you're going to want to talk, I will, talk we'll, to me about we'll, that. Absolutely, and we'll come yes. to that probably tomorrow. Yes. But c j just before we get to that, and, and we'll also look at Dr. Krask's letter, the, the remaining bit of Dr. Krask's letter that you drew attention to. But if we just, I just want to get a, a sense of the, whether there was any, any issue, as it were, between you, the department, um, on the one hand, and, and Dr. Galbraith about um, uh, his reasons as opposed mm. to the, 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 the corollary. So one, um, uh, probably due to a transmissible agent. Well, that was already your own view and yes. had been for some months. Yes. Probably transmitted by blood and blood products. Again, you were already a yes. view, and you said by this time it was mainstream view within the department. Yes. Um, three, uh, is a recognition that the number of cases present is very small. But this is a rather important point he makes, isn't it? This may not indicate that the risk is small, mm -hmm. indeed not in capitals. Mm -hmm. Um, um, and and he, then he talks about the period of time yes. that, that, that might elapse. Yes. Um, so was, was it... Um, that was not news to you, presumably, in, in, in May of 1983? No. I, I think that what I, I was... I don't think I had ever been aware of the actual potential range of the incubation period. And in point of fact, I think that range, which, which I think he put from six months to two and a half years or something like that, was probably, um, if you like, an underestimate. I mean, certainly the incubation period appeared to be long. I'm not sure how, how much information we had at the time about the length of the incubation period. I think when coming back to this, of course, is naturally I have come back to this, and I've looked and I thought well, there's some inconsistency to a degree in what he's saying, though I don't know that I identified it at that time, because he's saying withdraw all the product from 1978. Uh, and we chose 1978 because he said that AIDS had first appeared in America in 1978. Well, the implication was that actually product made in maybe 1976 was potentially infected. If we've actually got AIDS appearing by 1978, then with a long incubation period, actually there were infections in the um, donor population before 1978. Uh, I think possibly 1978 was uh, a strange number to, or strange date to suggest that, that material was withdrawn from because basically there really would have been no such material left um, in the country. But he was obviously saying in terms withdraw withdraw whatever you've got, if you will, which meant actually not only um, not using the stocks that were in the country, but not using any stocks that might be in hospitals around the country and that might be in people's fridges. You would have to have called in everything. So you would have immediately needed to say to uh, patients who were in, on the, having home treatment uh, with freeze-dried factor eight, sorry, you no longer can have that, hand in all your, your um, freeze-dried factor eight, uh, and basically we're going to try and see 
if we can give you some other um, substitute. Now, what was the other substitute would have been as much NHS factor eight as was available. Uh, of course, you didn't know that NHS factor eight was going to be free of AIDS, though you might assume that potentially, even if it were in the UK blood supply, uh, and of course we ultimately knew that it was, that it would be um, much less prevalent in UK donors than appeared to have been the case in, in American donors. Uh, or alternatively, cryoprecipitate for a, for a bad bleed, and there was virtually no cryoprecipitate being made in the country at the time, something like five million international units. So suddenly, as it were, on a sixpence, uh, the country would have had to um, cut out 50% of the factor eight that was, um, that was being used in, in the country at the time, certainly all the home treatment and any elective surgery and so on. Uh, there would be a question mark over the NHS factor eight, but you might still think that was, pos was likely to be safer, likely to be safer. And then there was not enough cryoprecipitate to really go around. So it was the most, as it were, draconian course of action that could be proposed. And the question was, could one, if you acted to do that on, if you like, the precautionary principle, that would be to try to prevent people having American factor eight. On the other hand, you potentially were going to do more harm to hemophiliacs by withdrawing their source of factor eight uh, and doing it in a way that would cause chaos and, and a, a totally chaotic rationing system. So it was absolutely between um, a rock and a hard place, if you like. There was no good option available. I'll come back to some of what you've said at, at a later stage, um, in particular what the consequences in terms of um, harm to haemophiliacs might have um, been or, or, or not been. But just in terms of the practicalities, mm -hmm. um, th this is a defined and known cohort of patients. So severe haemophiliacs, at least by their very nature of re receiving treatment of severe haemophiliacs, will each have been registered at a haemophilia centre, so they'll be yes. known. Yes. I if they're on a home treatment programme, that will be known. Yes. I if they've got supplies in their fridge, that's either known or not difficult to, to, to ascertain. Absolutely. Um, um, the inquiry certainly has received evidence to suggest that some areas had decent supplies of cryoprecipitate. It's obviously a matter that the inquiry will have to investigate further. But um, it wouldn't have to have been, would it, a question of turning off the tap immediately, necessarily? So there could have been a period of, of, mm. of working up to the production of mm. increasing the, the, the production of cryoprecipitate in regional transfusion centres. Non-elective surgery postponed on a temporary basis. Treatment, the amount of treatment used could have been reduced, the amount of concentrates used. So a conservative approach. Um, batch dedication or concentrate dedication instead of patients receiving multiple different batches, multiple different concentrates. So the, the, there's a whole range of possible strategies that could have been considered. There doesn't appear to be any evidence to suggest that they were considered either by the department or indeed by UKHCDA. Are, are you aware of any of those matters being given consideration? In terms of a strategy to try to see what you could do by way of rationing and to minimize the effects of rationing, I am not aware that there was any formal consideration of that. I think a, the, the issue really is if there's a problem, then you need to address it pretty well straight away. That means that you turn the tap off straight away. Now, absolutely, some regions were making more cryoprecipitate than others, but basically, if you look at the chart that I've put into my evidence, I think that the country as a whole was making about five million units of cryoprecipitate. Uh, 
And Dr. Lane, in one of his papers, said that actually some of the regional transfusion centers had simply stopped making it altogether and had repurposed some of their um, accommodation and would have to set the whole thing up again. Uh, and of course, there was the tension between wanting to be able to provide NHS factor eight for those haemophiliacs who really needed it, uh, severe haemophiliacs who, who might have uh, bled because of surgery or trauma, or they had a significant uh, amount of, of, an, of inhibitors, which meant they were not going to respond properly to cryoprecipitate. So I'm, I'm completely sold on the notion that you could have devised a strategy which would have minimized the really significant dis disruption. But what was not there was the time in which to do it. In other words, uh, <clears throat> to get that as right as you could possibly get it, given that you were going to cut the amount of commercial factor eight in the country by a half, when you still had a question mark over UK factor eight concentrate, but even setting that to one side, you were short about um, 30, 40 million international units of factor eight, which could not be readily made up. And it would have taken a lot of time, a lot of effort, but potentially you could ultimately have increased significantly the production of cryo in regional transfusion centers, but over time. Um, and I think it's right that, that there wasn't, as it, as it happened, an, an assessment or exploration of, of, of that as an option, as, as far as we can see. Um, so um, there isn't anything which says, well, we've assessed it and this is how long it will take, because it, effectively it was seen, and was it not as, as, an, as a yes or no, all or nothing it was, Question. yes, I think that's absolutely right. It, it appeared to be, uh, you need to do this straight away, uh, Dr. Galbraith's proposition. And I think it was seen as, well, either or. Um, there was also the situation that was happening in America, which we got to know about fairly soon after this, which was that the whole same considerations were being applied in America. And America, the FDA, um, also took the view that uh, supplies should not um, be curtailed uh, because, well, because of their the concern about the effects on haemophiliacs. So they weren't withdrawing product in, in America. And uh, essentially, that's given that they had more haemophilia um, sufferers who had actually um, developed AIDS in America that wasn't the line that they were taking. They even had a discussion in Congress in America to decide whether or not that should be done and, and decided on the basis of supply, reasoning perhaps exactly the way that was being done in the UK, that, that it, it just was an impossibility given the likely effects on, on haemophiliacs. And, and I'll come on to some of those matters, um, um, in particular um, in, in, in relation to what was being um, said in, in the States and, and the Department's response to that in, in, in due course. But just just, just sticking with, with Dr. Galbraith, if I may, um, you're, 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 you may be right that what Dr. Galbraith was essentially proposing was turning off the tap. Yes. You've explained why you didn't think you could immediately turn off the tap. But just because that was what he was proposing doesn't mean that department couldn't yeah. have come up with a more nuanced yes. slightly longer to implement program but there, there appears to be nothing to suggest anyone applied their mind to that is that is that i would fair? say that's fair and, and just to go back to the, the same document sorry chairman if we can have it back on screen uh, and if we go to the next page um uh, can i can i yes. it was absolutely fair that actually nobody was taking the view that we, we should try to pivot to cryoprecipitate straight away. But the were thought had been given to turning over to, to cryoprecipitate, um, and in fact to seeing if there was some way to uh, for BPL to make small pool products, which might potentially be uh, less um, dangerous, if you like, uh, than the large pool products. and all the thoughts that there were were discounted on grounds of, of logistics and practicality. So it, I suppose, in a sense, I'm, I'm um, not being fair to the, the collective view around the time, which was consideration was given 
to whether we could change over to cryo. Consideration was given to whether BPL could produce more pool products. Uh, and on each, for each matter, uh, the, dis the uh, view was, no, we can't, on logistic grounds. Uh, and I'll, I'll, when you say consideration was given to switch over to cryo, are you talking about the Committee on the Safety of Medicines decision there? No, I mean, Dr. Gunson considered it, Dr. Lane considered it. I think people were aware that there might be a, a call for more cryo and uh, considerably more cryo. And the question was, could that actually be done? And uh, given the state of play with the um, production of cryo in the RTDs at the time, with about maybe 5 million international units, it takes quite a lot of gearing up to, for them to be able to make, um, to make a, well, not a sufficient amount, they'd never have made a sufficient amount, but to make quite a lot more um, cryoprecipitate than was being made at the time. And of course, as soon as you don't make cryoprecipitate, you make cryoprecipitate, you're not sending plasma to BPL, and then you've got the problem of, well, how are you going to make your factor IX? Because you need the cryosupernatant to go to BPL to make factor IX for the haemophilia B um, patients. You need to make immunoglobulin and albumin all from, you can, you can make that from time-expired plasma, but basically you needed the factor VIII, uh, the cryoprecipitate supernatant to go to um, BPL. So you had not just to make cryo at the local RTDs, you had to have a system, and he, Dr. Lane describes it very well, I think, in his uh, draft evidence for the HIV litigation, in which regional transfusion centers, totally unused to doing this, would have needed to find a method sterilely to collect the, um, fact, the uh, cryoprecipitate supernatant to get it to BPL so that factor IX could be produced, because you did not want to disadvantage patients with haemophilia B whilst you were trying to advantage patients with haemophilia A. As far as you can recall, was, was the assumption on which these matters were being considered um, the, an assumption that you'd need to somehow find a way of replicating the amount of concentrate through cryoprecipitate. In, in, in other words, the assumption was we've got to continue treatment at the same level, we've got to continue home treatment. Because part of an answer to what you're describing might have been yes. a cessation of home treatment, mm -hmm. a restriction of concentrates um, for um, the, the truly life-threatening or, or the, the yes. necessary surgery. So, so there were potentially more imaginative, adaptive ways of looking yes. at it. And, and Please correct me if, if, if I'm wrong, but I, I don't think we see it being looked at in, in that light in the material. No, I think that's totally fair. And, and so then if we just, just to complete this document, we can see there's reference at the top of that second page to the incubation period, um, several months, two years, maybe as long as four years. Um, and, then if, uh, and then he talks about what the consequence might be in terms of the number of cases seen. Uh, um, Factor eight concentrate would appear to have a high risk of being contaminated with AIDS agent because homosexuals drug abusers are known to be frequent blood donors. And each plasma pool from which it's manufactured is collected from as many as a thousand donors. I mean, in fact, I think the number's probably considerably mm -hmm. in excess of that. But mm -hmm. again, there's, there's nothing controversial, is there, in, in, in terms of what Dr. Galbraith was saying there? That was well no. known to the department. Yes. Um, uh, point five, I think, again, is is again un uncontroversial N no known means no, no known means of ensuring blood or blood products are free of the aids agent at that point in time yes reference um uh to um the the, the multi-transfused um, infant and then again a significant fact a mortality rate a very high mortality rate articulated in, in six and although there might be different percentages given in, in different documents there was no dispute was there the mortality rate was a very high mortality rate. It was. Um, so if, if we then look at your views um, at the time as recorded in your memo or your minute to Dr. Field, it's DHSC 0002227 underscore 047.
So it's the 13th of May 1983, and you've clearly, from the text, written it after you'd attended the meeting yes. at St Thomas's. Uh, um, it's uh, addressed to Dr Field, top of the page. Um, so it refers to the letter from Dr Galbraith. You say, in my view, this suggestion is premature in relation to the evidence and unbalanced in that it does not take into account the risks to haemophiliacs of withdrawing a major source of their factor eight supplies. Perhaps the situation is best put in perspective by a statement which was drafted to appear in the minutes of the meeting of the directors of haemophilia reference centres, which I attended today. Um, and then we, we see your, um, uh, your note of what was agreed, which I don't think is materially different from what we see in, in, in the minutes. Um, uh, so circumspect to continue the policy in relation to children and mild haemophiliacs to NHS material, not sufficient evidence to restrict the use uh, and a suggestion of, of regional transfusion directors um, meeting. Um, in, in, if we just go back to your observation in the second paragraph, I think it's I understand from your evidence as to why you say Dr. Galbraith's suggestion was unbalanced. I, I, again, please correct me if I'm wrong. I don't read that as you saying unbalanced as in unhinged. You're saying no. it, hasn't put, no. it hasn't put the, um, uh, the implications for haemophiliacs into it, the balance. It was not weighing. You know, the, in public health terms, actually first do no harm. So you take a public health action you expect to improve matters and not actually to do harm. Potentially, potentially, uh, the action he proposed would cause harm, and his document didn't refer to that at all. He didn't apparently um, go on to say, I recognize that this may cause severe and major problems in the treatment of patients with hemophilia understandably, because that wasn't his particular discipline, but it wasn't mentioned in his document at all. And as a matter of fact, that's obviously correct that it wasn't mentioned. Conversely, one could say in terms of the do no harm, that, that where the department, UK, HCDO, the others ended up, was exposing patients to a risk. Mm -hmm. we, we obviously know that the, the full extent of, uh, mm. uh, uh, of that risk now, but a known risk mm. of a fatal disease. Yes. So the, the do no harm could apply equally the other way. Could it it could, but what we didn't know then, I mean, there was a huge amount we didn't know then, and I think that is an important consideration. Essentially, we were working uh, in nearly total ignorance of, of almost anything, uh, but what we, we didn't know then was that subsequently emerged really very good evidence from the use of stored samples, which I know is controversial, but nevertheless, stored samples were used from the Royal Free, for example, where it was shown that uh, well before the date of this meeting, uh, haemophiliacs at the Royal Free, in fact, 100% of the haemophiliacs being treated at the Royal Free uh, were actually in Sera converted, so that they had actually already been infected. I don't think that's quite right, Dr. Wolford, but um, because the inquiries looked at that data, and indeed zero conversion data about others, and, and it's actually a much wider spread. So there is certainly zero conversion before before this mm -hmm. date. Yes, but there are also ah, significant uh, numbers of zero conversions after. I'd, I'd, of course. I'm not for one moment denying that zero conversions will have occurred afterwards, but there was the, the issue that a certain number of infections had already occurred. Uh, there was nothing you could do about it, in fact, because it was in the, in the rear view mirror, so to speak. They had actually occurred, and it was not in significant number. So we didn't know that. I am now talking with the, the retrospectoscope, if you like, the benefit of total hindsight, we didn't know that, and I couldn't possibly have concluded it. What we didn't know was whether this material, this uh, infection was in the UK um, blood supply at all, for a start, so that would make uh, UK uh, plasma not, not safe. But also, had you taken, ever, taken the action proposed here, 
and had a certain number of hemophiliacs been damaged as a result of it, had bled, had had a cerebral bleed, had had a major internal bleed, had had a crippling bleed into joints as a result of that action. And they may have, in any case, have been infected already or unbeknownst to us. That would have been yet a, a double blow. So I, I would really propose to you that there was no good solution here. There was no good solution. On the one hand, we potentially were going to harm haemophiliacs by withdrawing this material because you couldn't readily actually uh, replace it. And on the other hand, uh, of course, we were potentially going to do harm by not withdrawing the material because of the transmission of an infectious agent, which had, by that stage, hardly put in an appearance in the UK. And I want to come back tomorrow to the question of what the severity of the consequences might have been for haemophiliacs um, of, of a, either a, of a reduction or cessation or change in treatment. Um, so I'll, I'll leave that till, till tomorrow, if I may. Can, can I just ask this? Um, you, you, you referred to the Royal Free Data. You, you referred to the fact that some people had already been infected, um, numbers obviously not, not yet known. But was there an assumption... Um, in, in your mind or in the minds as far as you're aware of any of those who were involved in the decision making w was there an assumption that played a part well if people have been infected they've already been infected so there's no point in taking any action D did, did that come into the decision making process it appears to have come into the decision making process in the HCDO because they actually mentioned that I'm not aware that that was in any sense in, in my thoughts of the time nor, I think, did I see it referred to at all in the CSM uh, consideration. Um, it, 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 um, it is referred to in HCDO uh, 6 series 3008, uh, the minutes you yes. just mentioned. With, they were the, the short notes that you've given. And I, I noticed in passing there seemed to be something of a what I thought was an, uh, an illogicality in it. Can we just go back to that? It's the, it's the where, you started just after the break. HCDO 603 underscore 008. It was the 13th of May one, I think. Yes, right. HCDO 603 underscore 008. And it's the second page, bottom half of the page. That's it. Uh, uh, can we go up, up the page? Thank you. Um, and it, it was this, the, the, the contrast between these two sentences which caught my eye when we were looking at it. It was agreed there was insufficient information available from the US experience to warrant changing the type of concentrate used in any particular patient. In other words, there's not enough evidence the people are at risk. But th then goes on to say, uh, once the condition is fully developed, it seems to be irreversible, so there seems to be no clinical benefit to be gained by changing to another type of factor eight. So on the one hand, there's no evidence that anyone has it. On the other hand, it's assuming that everyone has it. On the other hand, well, I'm sorry? There's no clinical benefit to be gained by changing to another type of factor eight supposes that the only product available is causing and has already caused the illness which is yet to materialize. Isn't that what it's saying? I, I think what it was saying here, uh, though actually I would almost take issue with the notion that just because somebody has developed, quotes, full-blown AIDS, that actually giving them some more virus was necessarily totally harmless. I, I just, that, that struck me as being a very strange way of saying you, you just don't know do you but but well, you certainly don't know but what what i think they seem to be saying is that if you can possibly if this is transmitting then we have to be very careful uh with making sure that the right concentrate is used with the right patient or the right factor 
uh, factor eight, be it cryo or, or D DDAVP or whatever is used with the right patients so that, so that if they're not already infected, there isn't a, um, so much of a possibility they will become infected. I think what they're saying here is that once full-blown AIDS is manifest in, in a patient, and it had to be said that apart from the Dr. Bloom's patient, nobody had seen such a case in the UK, but in America, uh, if they still needed product because they were bleeding, because they were hemophiliacs, then it wasn't going to do yet more harm, is what they're alleging, to give them uh, the fat rate concentrate again, because they were already irreversibly affected and were likely, unfortunately, to die of, of it, it, AIDS. It just seemed to be being put forward as a, an argument that uh, even though you did not know whether someone is in, was infected or not, um, there would be no point in changing because they might already be. Uh, well, I, didn't read, I, I, I confess I didn't read it that way. I, my, my quibble, if you like, was when I saw this was with, with that second sentence, the moreover, once the condition is fully developed. In other words, the patient is known to have AIDS, AIDS with its very um, significant mortality rate they're saying that change of product is immaterial because even if changing the product would prevent transmission to, to patients who hadn't got AIDS, once they already had got AIDS, there was, it was immaterial what product you gave them because they already had the condition and it was irreversible. That was my reading. Uh, I, I, I follow that, that, that the, the problem perhaps is the word moreover. Ah. I'm happy to say it wasn't my word. No, it's, yeah. of course it's not your word, but it, and it, it is, uh, admittedly, uh, as, as you, you would have it, uh, a very truncated uh, summary of what was being said. Yes. But it, it appears to be using as a justification for continuing as they were, uh, that if oh, the conditions... I see. Yes, no, sorry, I that, have misunderstood. That's, that's the significance of the word moreover, I think. Yes, I totally misunderstood. And if you took uh, the moreover out, it makes, it makes more sense. Yes, because it was apparently a corollary to following on from the sentence before, but it isn't, in effect. Well, it, it can't be, can it? No. it it's, uh, it's either a separate point, which yes. has got nothing to do with what treatment you give to people yes. who you do not know to have yes. uh, the condition. No, I, I understand. Yeah. It can't be a reason for going on as you are doing. No. Yes, that, that was all that I... Uh, that, that's what struck me. Yes. Thank you. Um, and, and then just b before we finish for today, uh, and for the sake of completeness, I just wanted to go back to Dr. Krask's letter because yes. he made reference to his views. It's WITN 4461127, Shomik. And we looked at it earlier in the context of the proposal for there to be a working party. If we go to the third paragraph and um, there's reference to the uh, the meeting on the 13th of May it refers to him attending and, and that you'll be attending um, it, it would appear that there's been a discussion between Dr Galbraith and Dr Krask um, uh, and, and reference to him writing to the department and of course we know that on that on the day of that telephone conversation Dr Galbraith did write to the department Dr. Krask's views are expressed in these terms. I'm not sure myself that we are at the stage where there is enough evidence to justify this step. But I think both the Department of Health and the Haemophilia Centre directors will have to face this problem in the near future. And the earlier it is seriously considered, the easier it will be to make a rational decision. I think that the outcome of the meeting will be that we will await the appearance of further evidence. But that if any more cases appear, then this may very well precipitate suspension of the use of this product in the UK. So Dr. Krask's position may have been a, a little more nuanced, which was not, not today, but any more cases, and it may well be a different outcome. Yes, I hadn't seen this letter until I saw the papers that you sent me. I wasn't aware of his, his view. Um, so that, that's probably a good point at which to finish for today. Well, just just on, on that, that last point, you, you describe in your, uh, your minute that it would be premature to do what, mm -hmm. what Dr. Galbraith was proposing. Mm -hmm. um, what would have been sufficient 
as you can remember seeing it at the time, and I appreciate it's difficult to put yourself back into a position which you weren't actually in, but what did you consider might have been uh, what would have ceased it being premature and made it now the time? Uh, well, I mean, for sure, if there had been firm microbiological or virological evidence that this was happening, uh, I think it needs to be understood that, for example, in, in America, there was still a lot of controversy as to what uh, was causing AIDS. So it wasn't a, a sort of um, a, done, a done deal, if I can put it that way, anywhere. Uh, there was controversy. There was controversy in, in America particularly, controversy uh, to a degree in, in this country. And basically, people were looking at an epidemiological association. An epidemiological association, as I certainly learned in subsequent years when I did my um, MSc in epidemiology, is not actually evidence of causation. And at the time, this was a debatable proposition. Frankly, my own view was that, that in fact, it was transmitting. Uh, but not everybody felt that. I'm pretty sure if there had been virological evidence that this was happening, uh, and there was some way of actually detecting it um, through, through uh, virology, I think that action would have probably been forthcoming much faster than it ultimately was. Thank you very much. Well, we'll take a, a break of air until uh, 10 o'clock tomorrow. So 10 o'clock tomorrow. Thank you very much. Yeah.